picking up with the last two steps of hypothesis testing. Step number four is to calculate the statistics. Now we're going to learn three different tests, a z-test, a t-test, and a proportions test, and we'll do them in slightly different ways. Here are the kind of options that we have for calculating our statistics. We could do them by hand using formulas, and we'll do that with our proportions test. Or we could use Excel, either with the formulas that we've learned or with the Excel data analysis tool pack. Other options would be using SPSS or JASP or R or Jamovi, other statistical software that's available for us to do our analysis. And I am going to show you the steps to do an analysis in those various ways, whether it's with Excel or JASP or if we're doing it by hand. If we use statistical software, the software will provide a p-value, confidence intervals, and the test statistics, all three of which we can use for interpreting whether our test is or is not statistically significant. Now it's time for step five. We look at the findings and then we make a decision. Ultimately, we're going to write up our decision in APA style. Here's how we would make our determinations. If the observed value, let's say for our t-test, is less likely than the critical value, then the difference between the sample and the population is statistically significant, or the population mean and sample mean are statistically significantly different. That means that you reject the null hypothesis. The difference between the sample and population means were not due to chance. And we assume that the alternative hypothesis is the accurate hypothesis that explains our findings. When we reject the null hypothesis, we're rejecting a hypothesis that says that there is no difference between the sample and the population. So if we reject the idea that there's no difference, we are concluding that in fact there is a difference between the sample and the population. In fact, our alternative hypothesis is the best explanation. Returning to our baby weight example, we have our distribution of sample means, and here's what we find. I've put an x-axis with numbers of pounds on the x-axis. The mean for the population is around 7.5. We then establish a lower and an upper critical value, which would be negative 1.96 standard deviations, which amounts to a weight of 4.95 pounds at an alpha level of 0 0.05. For our upper limit, the cutoff score is positive 1.96, a weight of 10.1 pounds, again, an alpha level of 0 0.05. All of the sample means that would occur under the curve have a probability greater than 0 0.05. It's very likely that we'll get a, a sample mean close to the population mean, very likely to occur. Only scores outside of the fences are statistically significant, p less than 0 0.05 we have a sample mean of 11. This observed value of 11 exceeds the right critical value of 10.10, and therefore it is statistically significant at a, at a criterion of p less than 0.05. And here's how we would interpret that. The mean of 11 for our sample is compared to a population value of 7.5, with a criterion value of p less than 0 0.05. Less than five times in 100 would we select a sample mean of 11 by chance if the sample and the population mean were really the same. And so there's one other idea that we should explore. As we make our decision, it's possible that we could be wrong. We could make an error. And there are two types of errors that can occur, type one and type two errors. 
When you accept or reject a null hypothesis, you can make a mistake. The null could be true, but you reject it. The null could be false, but you accept it. And I should quickly add that we never really accept the null hypothesis. We find support for the null hypothesis. It's always possible that it could be true. So typically we would describe it as we reject the null or we fail to reject the null rather than we accept the null. In the textbook, you'll find a decision matrix that looks like this. It is these errors uh, relating to the true state of the world and the sample outcomes and whether the null hypothesis is true or false, accepted or rejected, making a correct decision or a type 1 or type 2 error. And I know that this is really difficult to get your mind wrapped around. So let me use a much simpler example that's easier to follow. Let's talk about hypothesis testing and pregnancy testing. The true state of the world and the assumption that we're going to make is that most of the time, most people you encounter are not pregnant. We're going to start with the hypothesis that you are not pregnant. So this leaves us with a number of possibilities. If, in fact, you are not pregnant and the pregnancy test is negative, that is a correct result. You're not pregnant, the test says you're not pregnant. If you, in fact, are pregnant, and the test says that you're pregnant, that is also a correct result. And in both of these examples, we have avoided making an error in decision making. But there are two other possibilities, each of which we would call an error. If the true state of the world is that you are not pregnant, and yet the test says that you are, this is called a type 1 error, or a false positive. You're not really pregnant after all. Or, if you are pregnant, but the test says that you are not, that is a type 2 error, a false negative. You are pregnant, but you don't know it because the test said that you are not. So which of these two errors is more serious? Well, the type 1 error is certainly more noticeable. If you are not pregnant, and the test says that you are, it's going to become apparent pretty quickly that, in fact, you are not pregnant. And therefore, that error is going to be quickly identified. If you have a drug that you claim works, and yet we're not seeing any results from that drug, we're very quickly going to determine that this drug doesn't work. You said that it did, and in fact, you were wrong. And that could be... Uh, uh, certainly a noticeable and maybe even a career-ending mistake. Now, on the other hand, what would happen if you took a pregnancy test and the test says that you're not pregnant, but then later on you find out that you are pregnant? What we tend to say is, oh, well, maybe it was just too early. And so a type 2 error may not be as noticeable, but it can be very serious. If you're testing a drug that is effective for curing a very specific and rare form of cancer, and yet... It doesn't go to market. The, the, the drug does not get marketed simply because the expectation or, or the, the available evidence says that it doesn't work for, this, for, for any form of cancer. It stays on the shelf and we never get to, to use it and so people die as a result of that. Both type 1 and type 2 errors are serious. We want to try to avoid them when we possibly can. So this is how you can remember type 1 and type 2 errors. Let's start with that type 1 error. That is where you say that there is a genuine effect in the population when in fact there is not. You're saying something is true that is not true. What does that sound like? It sounds like lying. Remember Pinocchio? What happens when Pinocchio tells a lie? His nose grows. So think about the shape of Pinocchio's nose. It looks like a number one. So a type 1 error is saying that something is true when it is not, saying that there is an effect when in fact there is not. The probability of making this type of error is your alpha level, typically 0.05. Now a type 2 error occurs when you miss an effect that was really there. So we might use an example of the old dunce cap. You do this study, but you miss the effect, you big dummy. Think about the shape of that dunce cap. It's like two. So a type two error 
is saying that there is not an effect when there truly is. The probability of making this type of error is the beta level. Often we set that around a value of 0.2. So returning to this decision matrix that you may find in your textbook, hopefully now using this analogy of pregnancy testing, you have some hooks to hang your thoughts on as you do this interpretation. Well, that's all that we have to cover for this week. Thank you so much for being here for this coverage of an introduction to hypothesis testing. Next week, we're going to move into Z-tests, T-tests, and proportions tests. I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.